Good morning. Welcome here to Pastor United Methodist Church. Whether you are joining us here in person or online, I'm Pastor Jacob Hansen, and as always, it's a joy to be here in worship with you on a beautiful winter afternoon. We begin our service as we always do with our congregational prayer, and as always, there are several things for us to pray for today. We always begin our congregational prayer with a general prayer over the world, our nation, and our denomination, with all of the, the divisions and the concerns contained therein. We always do that. And then we always pray for those in our midst who are going through various things. Uh, beloved, there are several people who we are holding in our prayers. Chad uh, Sherman soon lost a good friend the other day. Good friend, Steve, who we pray for him and for Steve's entire family in this trip. We pray for uh, the Worthington family as John lost his sister, Laura, who was affected with his well this last week. And then for all of you here, you may remember looking at the Worthington family again. If you were to go to Billy, you would hear with us where we found our Chloe and Pat overnight. If you are uh, new here amongst us, uh, then you may never have met Chloe, but uh, we do remember the entire Billington and Jensen family in our prayers, especially our mother of the country, the first anniversary. I'm still going home to Chloe. In that same vein, you may note that in your bulletin there's a whole list. Of, uh, people with given point status. Now, thank you to, to those of you who have uh, you know, graciously given point status here to uh, Ms. Mitchell. It's also a beautiful. But I just want to highlight a couple of things in this. If you look at it, it's in honor of children and loved ones and the church and those who have passed. And you can look through this list, and, and I know that there are several folks on here. Uh, who were long-time members of the church who found home to Christ. There are people's parents, children, and grandchildren who have gone home to Christ who are on this little list, spouses and the like. And it's always good to remember, beloved, in this Christmas season, as we celebrate this Christ, as we celebrate time spent together, as we worship together, as most all of you, can think of loved ones who have passed. I can look around here this morning, and several of you have lost someone you love very dearly in the last year. Brothers, sisters, in-laws, and friends, and parents. It's good for us to remember, beloved, that the joy we celebrate at Christmas and at Advent isn't because uh, a virgin gave birth to a son. Although that is special, it's because of what Jesus would go on to do at the cross and what it means for us with his eternal salvation. Those loved ones who you miss so dearly, do you we can't help but remember in this time of year? Maybe in Christ, you know where they are. It's okay, no suffering, no sorrow. They're home with Jesus. And so, as we remember somberly, folks like Kelly who have gone home to the Lord, as you remember somebody, those that you love who found home to the Lord, we also rejoice that we know where we were at. So appropriately, we conclude our prayers this morning with a prayer for hope and joy and peace in the midst of us. That's what I have, beloved. What else can we do in prayer for this morning? Can I just ask for this? Thank you. 
Lord, Thank you. 
Paul or Frankenstein here. Well, the second is Frankenstein. And Frankenstein is really what it is. It's a very magic, very smelly tree sap. Well, I don't have any tree sap that's really smelly. You guys ever smell like the inside of a big tree or something? If you ever, like, are playing around in the woods and smell sap, it's sticky and very smelly to it, too. And then that, they got that, you're going to pop the top off that thing. That's the smelliest candle I can find in the house. Pretty smelly, right? So, you know, it smells like a surgery. You, you, you'll you smell it in a second if you have it already. It's very smelly. So, what Frankenstein is used for is it was burned. We worship the God. You know, like how we've got candles that we burn if we worship the Lord? They would burn a fragrant candle, a fragrant seal, a incense, a fragrance, and they would use the worship of God. The reason why that's important is that Jesus is God in human form. So it stands to reason they would give him something like that. Then they give them another one. He's got the little balloon box. He got it. All right. Also, uh, that's got more of like that, you know, old man balloon smell to it. So I don't recommend you spray that. That doesn't smell as good. <laughs> Maybe I'll take it back. But it was used to with another type of smelly oil, and it was used not to worship the God, but actually as part of an embalming ritual to do a thing. So they would rub that oil on a bench person and lay in the room. Now, thinking about Jesus, what did Jesus do for our sins? Died for our sins. Right? In fact, that whole song that we just sang, just a little bit ago, we didn't look at this right, but these three things, so these three guys show up with these gifts. The first one is gold, they bring the crown and the cave. Second is frankincense, which worship in the community was the name. The third is myrrh, a bitter perfume, which has to do with his death. And then there's a final one, right? Which is Jesus rising from the dead. You see, all these gifts tell us something about who Jesus is. Is and what he's come to do. He's come to be the King of Kings, Lord and Lord. He's come to be God and He's come to die for our sins. But if you think about Jesus, He also has come to be our Savior. And so that's really why we worship Him. And that's why we rejoice in His birth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and Lord, as we get ready to celebrate Christmas and give gifts, we remember that the best gift ever given was your son given to us. Father, we love him, we worship him, we thank you for Jesus, we recognize he's a king, we recognize he's God, we recognize that he makes you the grave in our place, and then he rose again. Help us to rejoice and celebrate this season well, and would you watch over all of our youngsters as they open gifts this morning. In your son Jesus' name we pray, O Lord. Amen. All right. Yeah, I'll take the kids back. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We're going to continue by reading two new sections of scripture this morning. We're going to Read Luke 2, 1 through 20, and then uh, the first half of Matthew 2, 1 through 13. It's all about the birth of Jesus. Okay, so in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. Okay? So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea. Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for a baby to be born, which gave birth to a firstborn, a son. He 
have seen in God's and great human amazement because there was no testament of rail this day. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, and they walked over the flock at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. For today, in the town of David, the Savior has been born to you. This is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in the manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared to the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph, and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerned concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned to glorify and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. That's the first half of our story today. We're also going to talk about the wise men who practice this as a gift, which comes out of Matthew 3. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, the Magi from a few cases of his women have asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and had come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the men back secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. He came to the Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully. Uh, and after they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen that rose from ahead of them until it stopped them in the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw it to the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned of his dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country and never left. Here ends our reading for this morning. Join me in prayer before we begin the message. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again today. On the week before Christmas, and we praise you and thank you, Lord, for allowing us the joy and the privilege and the honor of knowing you and knowing your Son, whose birth we celebrate. We pray, Father, for your wisdom and your understanding as we look at your word today. We pray, Father, you would be encouraging us and lifting us up and giving us a great joy. And we pray, Father, for the same for all who call upon your name. Thank you, Father, once again for everything. In your Son, Jesus, we pray that we pray. Amen. We've been here with us throughout Advent so far. What we've been looking at is a kind of a dichotomy that exists. It's both the glorious nature of God's plan coming to fruition, and also the incredible humility that God chooses when He comes to us. Thus far, we've looked at Jesus' parents, the earthly parents, Joseph, the adopted father, and Mary, his mother. And today, we look at the infant child. We are going to look a little bit at those who come to worship him, the shepherds and the magi who also bring gifts. A proclamation given by the angels and the prophecies fulfilled in his birth, they are all glorious and humbling. The Lord's beloved love to you abundant and equally strong. And he who is rightfully the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who is God Himself in human flesh, chooses to be born amongst normal folk to uplift the humbling spite of the cross. And there is no greater proof of this than how he chose to come to us 
thousand years ago. God is a king, God is a ruler, and as a human baby born in the name. We have a bunch of children up here for the children's message. Uh, most all of us at some point or another have held a child. Do you remember the first time you held a newborn baby? Do you guys remember that? What it was like? When was it? Was it a, a sibling? Were you the oldest and you held the youngest sibling? Or maybe it was with a cousin or your brother and sister had a kid before you and you got to hold that bundle of joy? Maybe it was your own child when you first held. For me, I can vividly remember the first time I held an actual baby baby, right? Like the one where you really feel like this thing is fragile. It was a little girl named Emma, and it was uh, one of my best friends from high school. She had this little girl. And I'm guessing it's the same for you as it is for me. Every time you see or hold uh, a, a newborn child, there's something frightening about it. The fragility, the lightness, right? The lack of weight, the smallness. Have you ever look at an infant in its crib, the crib that seems to swallow that kid. And of course, the utter dependence of a newborn child. A newborn child can do nothing on their own. In fact, they can't do much on their own until they're like 25. But that's not, uh, that's a sermon for another day. Out of all the ways the Savior of mankind could have come to us, Right? He could have come as a king. He could have come, you know, in full power and glory. This is what he chose to be a baby. A baby. It's the same exact way that every single one of us started our life. Every single one of us, from every year age, started off life completely fragile, vulnerable, and dependent. The your own Messiah chose pain. And there's something absolutely unbelievable about that, isn't there? You can't picture Jesus being fragile. We look at history guy, and it's always interesting when you look at ancient paintings regarding the birth. Because oftentimes, especially from the medieval period, I'll still uh, picture Jesus and you'll see Mary with an halo and Joseph, you know, the shape shining or whatever. And then there was a baby Jesus, but they put a feel like an adult face on baby Jesus. And this is why. It's because it's absolutely unbelievable to think that Jesus was something so lonely and humble as a tiny, regular old baby. Clearly, the Messiah came from that part of God of the world, right? Well, beloved, the truth is that your Lord loved you and I so much that in his glory, the angel said that Scripture said, as a baby, a regular old baby, in a manger. Who's who begins with the familiar title? We've read this several times. We'll read it at least twice more yet this week. But it's first. Joseph and Mary are required to go to Bethlehem by the tree of governor for a census. They have to travel to where their lineage is. And at this point, Mary is already heavily pregnant. And when they get there, they find that because of the census, because everybody has to travel from out of town back to their hometown, they find the inn is totally full. And so, they get a room not in a hotel, not in a palace. But in an expensive style, a farm. And it's there that Mary gives birth to Jesus. And wraps him as every other baby in that day would have been wrapped in swaddling cloths. Little crystal linen, a yay, yay, why, yay, why. They wrap him up. And this beloved is both glorious in all, in all ways and also, of course, incredibly humble. The glory of the birth comes from the prophecies that are answered. The prophecies that we look at each and every year. Here's four that uh, we see accomplished in Jesus' birth. Genesis 12, Genesis 3 reads as such. God gives this to Abraham. He says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who blesses you on the earth. And in you, all the families of the earth, will be blessed. And your lineage 
that through Abraham's lineage that the Messiah would come and that his salvation would be for peace on the earth. Jesus is that hero that the children of Moses are. Another one in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13, it reads, and this is God speaking to King Moses. When your days are complete, you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your descendant after you. He will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The name of the Messiah is not only in the Jewish nation, but specifically from the lineage of David, the royal line. Jesus comes to David's line. The ones we know are the next two. Verse 5 2 reads, As for you, Bethlehem, as for God, too little to be among the sons of Judah, for you one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. He's going forth from long ago, from the days of eternity. The Messiah is not only going to come through the lineage of Abraham, the lineage of David, but also is going to be born in a specific place in Bethlehem. And then they also throw in there that he goes to the city. Essentially saying he is God in human flesh. And as we all know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The final prophecy, the one that really sends it all home, is Isaiah 7 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will be a child and bear a son, and she will call him his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And Jesus, as we all know, is born of a virgin. The most miraculous of all things. Now, there are a lot of other prophecies that show up in Jesus being born, when and where he is. And there are many, many, many more prophecies that are fulfilled over the course of his life and his ministry. But this at least gives us a taste of Jesus' glory. The, the glorious prophecies that are realized in this little baby boy. A minister much more intelligent than me once equated these prophecies to the lines of an address, so a worldwide address. And if we use just those four of quoted for you, Jesus coming through Abraham, there to come to the country, and then being born through the lineage of David, being born of the tribe of the uh, royal line, narrows it down to the state. And then being born to Bethlehem, it narrows it down to the town and the street. And the final mark is being born of a virgin, which is the address to mark on the earth. It's the ultimate sign that Jesus could be no one other than the Lord in human flesh. Promised Messiah. In every way, shape, and form, beloved, that is glory. He is glory. And yet, while Jesus, Jesus' birth fulfills these prophecies, and while his birth is announced by angels and with a star in the sky, we all know just how humble it really is. His parents are born. He's born in a manger. He's a regular baby. He's wildly humble. But the creator of all chose to come in this fashion. And it goes even further. The people that hear Jesus at first, first, are not kings and queens. They're not religious leaders. They're not the, the, the top of the They're not the, uh, you know, college educated. They're shepherds. They're average shepherds in the field. We read that in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the field and keeping over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord ascended, stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. Now we often have this perception, right, because we've all seen the children's place. Everybody's invited to the kids' place, excuse me, by the way. But of these humble shepherds, right, wearing these nice clothes, holding a shepherd's crook, and we think they're like the humblest, kindest, gentlest people on the planet. We're a little bit off. We just think them that way because they're the first ones to see Jesus. But the reality is, these are regular people. They're a good representative of who Christ has come to save. And not because they were the most holy or the most meek and mild mannered, 
that because they were known to be normal. Maybe even a bit rough, a bit rough around the edges. The shepherds of Jesus' time were normal men with normal jobs. And in fact, a lot of what they had to do, part of the job was religious observances. Or at least improbable. Any scholars agree that the shepherds of this day would be looked down upon by many who lived in the city, particularly the religious elite. But they didn't do everything that the ceremonial laws and rituals required. Special hand washing, all the Sabbath day observances, the special purity laws. Those are mostly out of reach because these guys got to be in the field with their feet. I guess if you've ever been in that situation where you're like, you know, uh, for, for any of you farm guys or who are farming, where you want to be in church on Sunday but it's hard for planting, that's not true. If you ever had a work meeting that happened during a time where you knew of that kitchen church for this, but I just I can't. Dad was a firefighter, mom was a nurse. We never had both mom and dad in the home or in church on a Christian Jesus Christ and Christ. Right? It's just, that's the reality of life. And for these guys, that they had animals to care for, even though they were Jewish, even though they had the same lineage, even though they had the same prophecies of the Messiah, the reality was they couldn't do their all as a special religious stuff. And so, Started to look down on the average city guys and nobody was bad about it. It's interesting that they ended up with that stigma. But the very people who are the patriarchs of Israel, the very people who received all these prophecies about Jesus, they themselves kept the same. Abraham and his whole family, Isaac and Jacob, the pastor's wife, they were shepherds. King David, you may remember, before he killed Goliath with a stone, he was a shepherd boy. In fact, he was a shepherd in the very general city of shepherds for now pastors. And if you want to go even further into how interesting this is, the people who were being captured in this area around Bethlehem were known to have special purpose. These people had kept the priests for sharing with the food. Most of the priests that they would have been capturing would have been used to sacrifice in Jerusalem. In particular, the sacrifices surrounding Passover. And if you know anything about Jesus being the Passover lamb, there's the connection for you to sacrifice for our sins. But in looking again at the shepherds, we can bring this into our world because Jesus' birth was for the average man and woman the world over. There's this wonderful story that's repeated in the gospel that follows along the same vein. Jesus is not just for the ruler. He's not just for the religious elite like Billy Graham, or even Pastor Jake, or missionary, or the like. He's for men and women of all walks of life. The joy of Christ's birth wasn't ever meant for a select you alone, but for any and all the world over who would accept this free gift. There's always for any and all who would hear this message. And this includes those who may be sitting in church all the time, particularly you, truck drivers and farmers and night shift workers. Jesus is very still is for you. Still is for you. And so, if Jesus is first was announced in our day, in our time, here in God's county, it probably wouldn't have been announced to Pastor Jake or the Parsonage. It probably wouldn't have been announced to City Hall. It probably would be announced to the village workers or the night shift over in Rochester or something like that. No one would The humility of our Lord Jesus to choose the shepherds of all people to announce his glory cannot be understated. Going back to the shepherds. And then here that the Messiah has been born, they travel to Bethlehem to see the Christ child for themselves. And when they get there, they see exactly what the angels are proclaimed, and they tell Mary and Joseph everything they've seen. All they've seen, all they've seen, and behold. And then they go on, and everyone hears their account, 
marvel and the shepherds be glorified and praise of God. Lord, they are coming to the This is the confirmation for the shepherds, as well as another confirmation of Mary and Joseph that Jesus is not just a normal baby boy. He is the Messiah. As glorious and as humble as the teaching of the shepherds is, there's another group that comes within the first couple of years of his life to work in as well. And this too shows that by time. We know him as the magi and the wise men from the east and the worshippers. Matthew 2 gives the account, verses 1 through 12. He went to Israel by a star that the spirit was persuaded with the Messiah's birth. Uh, the scriptural reference to the star actually is pretty tenuous. You know, we talk about the Christmas star every year and stuff, and we think about it. But it only comes from this one lone verse in Numbers 24 17, which reads, I see him but not now, I behold him but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob, in Israel. A scepter shall rise from Israel, and shall crush through the head of Moab and tear down all the sons of Jacob. In the ancient Hebrews, we have heard this from Moses. They have recognized that God's going to raise up a great king, conquer your enemies, and protect your people. So, this is the beautiful light of another prophecy about the birth of the Messiah. If you've ever wondered, okay, so what was the star actually? Since we're talking about it, practically, scholars have had a bunch of ideas over the years about what the Christian star might have been. Some have speculated that there was a supernova that took place, and indeed, in some uh, Chinese astrological records, they know that a supernova had taken place in roughly this time period. Others think that maybe it was Saturn and Jupiter's their orbits had linked up a couple of times for a few months around this time, so maybe it was that. It was common to even found to go during the same time period, so maybe that's the answer. Many of those think that the star was just what it sounds like, just a miraculous sign that showed up and led these bad guys to Christ. Then we're back to the wise men. We don't know everything about the star, and we don't know everything about them either. Then since they came from Babylonian descendants, because they had come from Babylon, that they had heard about the Messiah's birth all the way back in Israel and the exile there. That makes sense because the prophecy about where Jesus was to be born was even after Israel had already left. But they found him where in Jerusalem from the religious leaders at that time is where they should go. And in time, they come to where Jesus is with Joseph and Mary. And when they arrive, they present three gifts to Jesus. Three gifts that link directly to Jesus' future. His ministry, life, We have to take what we give, but let's take a look at it again. Three gifts here to tell us something about him. Gold is broken. King of kings, Lord of lords. It's the most appropriate gift you can give to him. Although, of course, kings have all the money in the world. Why they need this? I don't know. But it is appropriate. Frankincense and myrrh actually are both appropriate as well. They're expensive, aromatic spices. But there's more to the story. Frankincense was used in some churches, which today still use. If you've ever been in a service where that guy's like a singing thing filled with smoke, that's what he's doing. He's spreading his incense. He's in worship of the Lord. Speculated about the scripture to that Jesus is God and he is God. And myrrh, which is also fragrant, wasn't used in worship, but rather as part of the embalming process of the funeral. And that is what the connection over the years, including in the Hindu song, that links directly to his gospel activity. Regardless if this was the intention or not of the Magi, these people have come to worship the Father of Jesus. And it's a glorious sign again that Jesus is God. But it's also humble in that of all the people, all the rulers who could have come, the foreigners are not the Jewish religious leaders who are next door. Another wonderful sign for us, too, because Jesus is first, isn't only for those who have grown up in a Christian nation or a Christian home, 
But for any and all, whenever they come to know the Messiah, this birth is for them too. Jesus' joyous birth and subsequent ministry of salvation is for all who enjoy Jesus. Love it in this amazing time of year that we are just one week away from Christ's birth when we are gearing up to see family, right? Have our special positions. There's tons of reasons for our joy. He just comes in glory and humility for the salvation of all mankind. The salvation we enjoy and rejoice in is not just for the special or the elite, but for the common man and woman of the rest of world. Yeah. You've ever wondered at the end of the day if Jesus' birth is the new church, if the Messiah, his life, his death, and his resurrection is for you? You've ever wondered if Jesus cares for you, loves you, died for you, rose from the dead for you? The answer is that his birth to you, his death and resurrection, his coming to the church. Thank you, Father, that your son's birth is not just a miraculous sign, but it's the beginning of his promise of salvation. Lord, we connect what happens on Christmas morning to Easter. And we thank you, Father, that it isn't just for the special or the religious. But it's for any and all who call upon your name, who come close to you, who heed your call, who give their lives to you. Thank you, Father, that this salvation is for all of us, all your family. It's in this name that we pray. Amen. Would you pray with us, Lord? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
you start closing again, the twins will stay for a weekend away from the home.
Um, and he was like, just to sit with you and meet your friends, whatever. And then the party at the office, uh, right outside the office, um, in the white room there. Again, don't pass the top of the light. So, so. Uh, 27 lines, if you saw 27 here and you're not going to be here for Christmas Eve, please pick them up today. If you are going to be here for Christmas Eve, you can leave them and pick them up after Christmas Eve service. Thank you to everybody who has separated and who has uh, purchased 27. And then finally, our Sunday school program is tonight at 6 p.m. It's going to be in the fellowship hall. And so for this morning, for coffee hour, we're going to be eating and here with the table. Yeah, so we're going to have your portion and come back. 